morning and welcome to Sunday School as we look at a very unusual uh, set of scriptures and uh, the name of today's lesson is politics and that's not our favorite word in all the world and uh, I've got to tell you that down through the years I've, I've voted against more people than I've voted for I've just tried to take what I consider to be the lesser part of two evils, but we do have scripture that talks about our responsibility as a Christian to the government, and so we're going to take a close look at that, and hopefully all of us uh, will uh, know a little bit more about it uh, when the lesson's over than when it began. Pray with me and we'll get started. Father, we lift up the set of verses in Romans to you and we just ask that you bless the reading of your word and Father, please help me to be correct and and uh, we just pray that your Holy Spirit might take over and, and uh, this lesson might be all that you want it to be. And Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans, the 13th chapter in the first verse. Everyone, very inclusive, everyone must submit himself to the govern, governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Well, one of the first things that roll into our mind, Scripture was written a long time ago, but is this still true and applicable today? Well, nobody had worse rulers than the Roman Empire had when this Scripture was written. And these authorities will be the same ones that, that kill Christians and burn them alive and, and uh, just try to destroy the New Testament church. So we can't use that excuse because Paul said that they owed that then and now they owed something to the government. And he also said there is no government that God hadn't established. And let's talk about that for just a minute. Now there was government that got so bad that God done away with an individual government and brought somebody else in. And I can, I can assure you that, that our government doesn't do everything that God wants it to do. But the, but the government was established so Christians could live, God's people could live a peaceful, honorable life. Now things have changed so much. And one of the things that's happened in the United States is that we now are governed by people that have no earthly idea about our Christian heritage. And if you go back to the original uh, writers of the Constitution, some of them actually made the statement that this form of government, our original leaders knew that our form of government would not function like God wanted it to without a Christian influence and a Christian nation, and we do not have that anymore. And part of that is the fault of Satan, and part of it is uh, the fault of the New Testament church because we have not uh, held up our end of the bargain. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, whether we like it or don't like it. And just to show you that it's not one passage of scripture, we're going to look at some others, and we're going to look at Luke 20. And we're going to see what Jesus has to say. In Luke, the 20th chapter and the 20th verse, 
Keeping a close watch on them, they sent spies who pretended to be honest. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said, so they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. So the spies questioned him, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right, and that you do not show partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Christian, is it right for us to pay taxes and we see our tax money used for abortion and uh, same-sex marriage and all the different things that have changed? Well, remember what kind of atmosphere the government was in Jesus' time and listen to what he says about whether you ought to pay your taxes or not. He saw through their duplicity, and he said to them, Show me a denarius, whose portrait and inscription are on it. Caesar's, they replied. He said to them, Then give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God. They were unable to trap him in what they and what he had said there in public, and astonished by his answer, they became silent. Okay. I don't like to pay taxes. <laughs> Do you like to pay taxes? I don't like the way my tax money is used at times. Do you? But Jesus said, Pay unto Caesar what Caesar's. And pay unto God what's God's. One of the things that government was instituted for was to take care of people that live outside of what we consider the law. And listen to what God says in Genesis the ninth chapter in the sixth verse. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God, God had made man. God said in Genesis, not individually, but as a government, there is such a thing as capital punishment, and one of the reasons for capital punishment is men shedding men's blood. It is against all that God stands for, for us to take a life uncalled for. First Timothy. The second chapter in the first verse. I urge you then, first of all, that request, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone. Now listen to the list. For kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceable and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. It is our responsibility to pray for our government and the people that are in leadership roles. Whether we personally like them or dislike them, that's not a qualifier. Scripture says we're to pray, we're to lift up our nation's men and women who are in authority. Now let me tell you a little secret. If you don't like the way government is today, we need more Christians going into leadership roles in our country than we now have. Don't expect people that don't understand or don't care for the Word of God 
to govern this nation like God would really like for it to be governed. Verse 2. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers, when it's done like God instituted government to do, for rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. We've had so much talk about uh, our police and what needs to be done and is being done in places. And I read this morning that some of the places that have basically disbanded the police <coughs> are now hiring private body bodyguards and the government is paying for it. Their state government is paying for it. So they'll be protected. And yet they're turning around and disbanding the police forces for everybody else. Something's not exactly right. Do right. Live a peaceable life, an honorable life. And on the whole, government will leave you alone. Talking about those in authority, verse 4 said, For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an angel, an agent of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoers. A lot of Bible scholars will tell you that that's one of the places that capital punishment is talked about in Scripture. That the government does have the right, does have the sword, does have the power to judge people, find them guilty, and execute them. It also said over in Genesis, if you take another's blood, another innocent person's blood, that you owe in blood. The way we see things done now, it's hard to know who the guilty is and who the innocent is. Because it seems like some of the people that are the guiltiest are being called heroes and some of the people that have done right are being called anything but heroes. Verse 5, therefore it is necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of possible punishment but because of conscience. In other words, we ought to do right because inside of us we have a godly conscience. If we're a believer in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God is there to whisper in our ear, this is right to do no matter whether you get caught or not. This is the right thing to do. Do it. Or this is the wrong thing to do. Don't do it. When do we not do what the government says? 
the list of the reasons is pretty narrow. And before you defy authority, you ought to make absolutely sure of why you're defying authority. And I'm going to read you one of the places in Scripture where they absolutely defied what the authorities told them to do. And it was scriptural, and it was the right thing to do. Acts, the fifth chapter, and the 27th verse. Acts five twenty seven. I'll bring you in so because we're kind of going in a place without you knowing what's going on. They had called the disciples in and told them, told them to quit preaching in the name of Jesus. And they went right on preaching. And so verse 27, having brought the apostles, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. <coughs> And this is what they told him. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Which was absolutely the truth. Now the Sanhedrin had been given the authority by the Roman government to control the Jews. So this was an empire authority and this is Peter's answer to him. Peter and the other apostles replied we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, who God, who God has given to those who obey him. But when they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, whom was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered the men to be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Thaddeus appeared claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed. All of his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days for the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all of his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourself fighting against God. His speech pers uh, persuaded them. They called in the apostles and had them flogged, ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that is Jesus Christ. This is when we have scriptural basis to disobey <clears throat> human government. If they tell us to do something that we know is against the scripture, don't do it. If they tell us we can't do something that we know Scripture said we're supposed to do, do it. 
This is the only place it really shows when the government is in direct conflict with the Word of God and what his people are to do or not to do that gives us the right to not obey the authorities. Verse 6 said, This is also why you pay taxes. I don't like that. <laughs> you know, you work and you save and you get taxed about three or four or five times on the same money and we don't like that. And then we sure don't like how they spend it. But this is why we pay taxes. For the authority are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. And if you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor then honor. If you're like me, these verses are not exactly what I want to hear. You do understand that nobody's going to get in the pulpit at Austin Street Baptist Church and tell you who you're to vote for in November. I certainly wouldn't. When we do that, we take the chance of having our uh, tax exempt status wiped away. For the other, we're in the business of winning souls, not changing government. But what I will tell you is you look at this book and you read this book and you see what it says about what's going on in our society and our world and you see what agrees with this or what disagrees with this and then you look at the candidates and you vote for the one that was most like what this scripture says is what God wants. And if that's a Democrat, vote Democrat. And if that's a Republican, vote Republican. But we need to vote with our spirit, not just our likes and our dislikes. I wish I could tell you that I support all of the ones I've voted for down through the years. I do not. For a long time, I've voted against people and not for people. I took what I thought was the less of two evils, and that's how I voted. Did I always vote the right way? Probably not. But I'm not going to tell you who's supposed to be sheriff, who's supposed to be county judge. I'm not going to tell you who's supposed to be the governor of the state. That's your decision. You look. You understand. You look at these candidates. You hear what they say. And compare it. Forget the, par the party. I don't care if it's a donkey or an elephant. You look at what this book says. And you see what they stand for. And you vote for the one that you believe stands for the closest thing in this book you can find. Verse 8. Let no debt remain outstanding. Now that's talking about money or possessions or whatever it is. Be careful about who you owe money to. Accept the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. We've got to stop and talk about that.
you think of all the Old Testament laws, you think about the Ten Commandments, but Scripture says, if we love our neighbor as we love ourselves, it will take care of all those different things that's in the book. And in, in Scripture it tells us, if we'll just love God and love people, that's what it's all about. You know, you don't have to like somebody to love them. We forget that sometimes. You know, some people are really easy to love. Some people are not so easy to love. But he didn't say anything about that. It says, if we love our neighbor as ourself, we'll do the right thing when the decision comes. Now here's an example, starting in verse 9. The commandments, do not commit adultery. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to run off with his wife or husband. Do not murder. There's physical murder, and we can kill a person with our mouth. If we love our neighbor, be very careful what you say about each other. Do not steal. Do not covet. You know, there's a difference to uh, seeing your neighbor drive in in a new pickup and being impressed with the pickup and wishing you might have one one of these days. But the covet is to wish you had that guy's pickup. That's two different things. And whatever other commandments there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Our world sure doesn't get that, does it? Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love God. Love your neighbor. And the Old Testament law is taken care of and the New Testament law is taken care of. You want to please God, love Him and love your neighbor and treat people like somebody you really love and you'll please God. And do this. Understanding the time. Now we need to hear this. It wasn't in the book, but we're, you're going to get it anyway. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in the orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality, debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And do not think about how to gratify the desires of our sinful nature. Now the first part of this, verse 13 and 14, is talking about the time when Jesus comes back to take his church out of here. Well, this has been 2,000 years 
since this has been written and Paul was telling this churches the day's nearly over. Well, the only thing I can tell you is if it was nearly over then, it's certainly nearly over now. And some people feel like that because of what's happening in our country, that it, it's a blueprint of what Scripture says is going to happen in the end time. Now, I'm not that good, and I can't tell you that Jesus is coming tomorrow or next week or next year or 50 years from now or 100 years from now. The only thing I can tell you is what little I understand in Scripture. There's not one prophecy left that needs to be fulfilled that would keep or hinder Jesus Christ from coming back for his church today. So what do we learn? government was instituted by God Almighty. We're supposed to be good citizens. We're supposed to pray for our government and the individual pieces. Whether we like them or dislike them, God says pray for them. We're supposed to love our brothers and sisters as ourselves. And that tells us that that will take care of the law. And this says, wake up. Wake up. Jesus could come today. You know, we do this on Wednesday. We film this on Wednesday. Trina comes out and we have lunch and and then we filmed the Sunday school lesson. I can't tell you that this lesson will ever be broadcast. Jesus may come back before then. Or he may not. Verlaine and I have talked. Uh, we don't like the way things are going. But, excuse the telephone. But we're not worried about us. We've lived nearly our lifetimes out, but we certainly do worry about our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. If this country, under the leadership of a God-filled revival, doesn't change the direction it's going, The days of this country being that beacon of light for the rest of the world is going to go out. Honor those that work in the government. Honor the people that protect you. Pay your taxes, hard as it is. Watch what you say about people. Love your sister and your brother and wake up and know that we need to be about the business of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of the commentators that I read to prepare for this lesson made this statement. He said, we're not here to change government. That didn't mean vote your, that doesn't mean not to vote the way we talked about. He said we need to be a positive influence in society, but that's not the reason we're here. We're supposed to love and help people, but that's not the reason we're here. We need to remember God's New Testament church is here on earth to share the gospel of Jesus and to let him win people to himself. That's the reason we're here. And when we make decisions at church or we make decisions at our house or we make decisions here or there, the overriding fact is, are we looking to win people to Jesus Christ 
And is that the number one thing on our heart and mind? It's said in these scriptures, God wants everybody to be saved. I love you, but not near as much as God loves you. Read the instruction manual. Let God touch your heart. Let him make a difference in this world through you. And that difference means that we need to be making relationships that gives us an opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And in that very, very precious name, that's the end of today's lesson. I have something kind of exciting to tell you. I won't do a lesson like this next Sunday. Brother Tim Williams talked to our church Sunday night about calling a new pastor and what we should expect and what he should expect. And he's agreed because we feel it is so terribly important that uh, Sunday after next. He's going to come back and take the Sunday school time and Garland and I are going to put our classes together and we're going to probably go in the auditorium where everybody can spread out and feel safe and we want as many people as can be there to hear what Brother Tim says and then we want a good film of it so that those of you that don't feel secure enough to come can hear what he says about calling a new pastor. I look forward to uh, hearing what he has to say. He certainly touched my heart and I think everybody's heart that was there Sunday night as he shared about calling a new pastor. Love you. Austin Street loves you. Take care. Bye-bye.